Rail transport in Great Britain The railway system in Great Britain is the oldest in the world. The first locomotive hauled public railway opened in 1825, which was followed by an era of rapid expansion. Whilst the network suffered gradual attrition from about 1900 onwards, and more severe rationalization in the 1950s and 1960s, the network has again been growing since the 1980s. Most of the track is managed by Network Rail, which in 2017 had a network of, of standard gauge lines, of which were electrified. These lines range from single to quadruple track or more. In addition, some cities have separate metro, light rail, and tram systems, including the extensive and historic London Underground. There are also many private railways, some of them narrow gauge, which are primarily short lines for tourists. The British network is connected with that of continental Europe by the Channel Tunnel opened in 1994. The United Kingdom is a member of the International Union of Railways, UIC. The UIC country code for United Kingdom is 70. The UK has the 17th largest railway network in the world, despite many lines having closed in the 20th century it remains one of the densest networks. It is one of the busiest railways in Europe, with 20% more train services than France, 60% more than Italy, and more than Spain, Switzerland, the Netherlands. Portugal and Norway combined, as well as representing more than 20% of all passenger journeys in Europe. The rail industry employs 115,000 people and supports another 250,000 through its supply chain. In 2016, there were 1.718 billion journeys on the national rail network, making the British network the fifth most used in the world. Great Britain ranks 23 written world population. Unlike a number of other countries, rail travel in the United Kingdom has enjoyed a renaissance in recent years, with passenger numbers approaching their highest ever level, see usage figures below. This has coincided with the privatization of British rail, but the cause of this increase is unclear. The growth is partly attributed to a shift away from private motoring due to growing road congestion and increasing petrol prices, but also to the overall increasing travel due to affluence. However, Passenger journeys in Britain grew by 88% over the period 1997-98 to 2014 as compared to 62% in Germany, 41% in France and 16% in Spain. To cope with increasing passenger numbers, there is a large program of upgrades to the network, including Thameslink, Crossrail, electrification of lines, and cab signaling, new intercity trains and a new high-speed line. The railways started with the building of local isolated wooden wagonways in 1560s. These wagonways then spread, particularly in mining areas. The system was later built as a patchwork of local lines operated by small private railway companies. Over the course of the 19th and early 20th centuries, these amalgamated or were bought by competitors until only a handful of larger companies remained. See Railway Mania. The entire network was brought under government control during the First World War and a number of advantages of amalgamation and planning were revealed. However, the government resisted calls for the nationalization of the network, first proposed by 19th century Prime Minister William Ewart Gladstone as early as the 1830s. Instead, from January 1, 1923, almost all the remaining companies were grouped into the Big Four, the Great Western Railway, the London and Northeastern Railway, the London. Midland and Scottish Railway and the Southern Railway Companies, there were also a number of other joint railways such as the Midland and Great Northern Joint Railway and the Cheshire Lines Committee as well as special joint railways such as the Fourth Bridge Railway, Ryde Pier Railway and at one time the East London Railway. The Big Four were joint stock public companies and they continued to run the railway system until December 31, 1947. The growth in road transport during the 1920s and 1930s greatly reduced revenue for the rail companies. Rail companies accused the government of favoring road haulage through the subsidized construction of roads. The railways entered a slow decline owing to a lack of investment and changes in transport policy and lifestyles. During the Second World War the companies' managements joined together, effectively forming one company. A maintenance backlog developed during the war and the private sector only had two years to deal with this after the war ended. After 1945, for both practical and ideological reasons, the government decided to bring the rail service into the public sector. From the start of 1948, the Big Four were nationalized to form British Railways, latterly British Rail, under the control of the British Transport Commission. Although BR was a single entity, it was divided into six later five, regional authorities in accordance with the existing areas of operation. Though there were few initial changes to the service, 
usage increased and the network became profitable. Regeneration of track and railway stations was completed by 1954. In the same year, changes to the British Transport Commission, including the privatization of road haulage, ended the coordination of transport in Great Britain. Rail revenue fell and in 1955 the network again ceased to be profitable. The mid-1950s saw the rapid introduction of diesel and electric rolling stock, but the expected transfer back from road to rail did not occur and losses began to mount. The desire for profitability led to a major reduction in the network during the mid-1960s, with EC manager Dr. Richard Beeching commissioned by the government under Ernest Marples with reorganizing the railways. Many branch lines, and a number of main lines, were closed because they were deemed uneconomic, the Beeching Acts of 1963, removing much feeder traffic from main line passenger services. In the second Beeching Report of 1965, only the major trunk routes were selected for large-scale investment, leading many to speculate the rest of the network would eventually be closed up this was never implemented by BR. Passenger services experienced a renaissance with the introduction of the Intercity 125 trains in the 1970s. Passenger levels fluctuated since then, increasing during periods of economic growth and falling during recessions. The 1980s saw severe cuts in government funding and above inflation increases in fares, and the service became more cost-effective. In the early 1990s, the five geographical regions were replaced by a sectored organization, in which passenger services were organized into intercity, network southeast and regional railways sectors. British rail operations were privatized during 1994 to 1997. Ownership of the track and infrastructure passed to rail track, whilst passenger operations were franchised to individual private sector operators. Originally there were 25 franchises, and the goods services sold outright. Six companies were set up, but five of these were sold to the same buyer. The government said privatization would see an improvement in passenger services and satisfaction, according to the National Rail Passenger Survey, has indeed gone up from 76% in 1999, when the survey started, to 83% in 2013 and the number of passengers not satisfied with their journey dropped from 10% to 6%. Since privatization, passenger levels have more than doubled and have surpassed their level in the late 1940s. Train fares cost 2.7% more than under British Rail in real terms on average. However, while the price of any time and off-peak tickets has increased, the price of advanced tickets has dramatically decreased in real terms, the average advanced ticket in 1995 cost £9.14, in 2014 prices, compared to £5.17 in 2014. Rail subsidies have increased from pound BN in 1992-93 to pound BN in 2015-16 in current prices, although subsidy per journey has fallen from pound per journey to pound per journey. However, this masks great regional variation, as in 2014-15 funding varied from £1.41 per passenger journey in England to £6.51 per journey in Scotland and £8.34 per journey in Wales. The public image of rail travel was severely damaged by a series of significant accidents after privatization. These included the Hatfield accident, caused by a rail fragmenting due to the development of microscopic cracks. Following this, the rail infrastructure company Railtrack imposed over 1,200 emergency speed restrictions across its network and instigated an extremely costly nationwide track replacement program. The consequent severe operational disruption to the national network and the company's spiraling costs set in motion a series of events which resulted in the collapse of the company and its replacement with Network Rail, a state owned, not for profit company. According to the European Railway Agency, in 2013 Britain had the safest railways in Europe based on the number of train safety incidents. At the end of September 2003, the first part of High Speed 1, a high-speed link to the Channel Tunnel and onward to France and Belgium, was completed, significantly adding to the rail infrastructure of the country. The rest of the link, from North Kent to St Pancras Railway Station in London, opened in 2007. A major program of remedial work on the West Coast Main Line started in 1997 and finished in 2008. In the 2010s, many upgrades are underway, such as the Thames Link program, Crossrail, the Northern Hub and electrification of the Great Western Main Line. Electrification plans for the Midland Main Line and the Cross Pennine Line between Manchester and Leeds have been paused with the start of work on TC projects postponed to some indefinite dates in the 2020s. Construction of High Speed 2 is underway, 
with a projected completion date of 2026 for Phase 1 London to Birmingham, and 2033 for Phase 2. Passenger services in Great Britain are divided into regional franchises and run by private, that is, non-state-owned, train operating companies. These companies bid for 7-8 to eight year contracts to run individual franchises. Most contracts are awarded by the Department for Transport, DFT, with the exception of Mersey Rail, where the franchise is awarded by Merseyside Passenger Transport Executive, and Scott Rail, where the DFT awards on the advice of the Scottish Government. Initially, there were 25 franchises, but the number of different operating companies is smaller as some firms, including First Group and Stagecoach Group, run more than one franchise. In addition, some franchises have since been combined. There are also a number of local or specialized rail services operated on an open access basis outside the franchise arrangements. Examples include Heathrow Express and Hull Trains. In the 2015 16 operating year, franchise services provided 1,718 million journeys totaling 64.7 billion billion passenger km of travel, an increase over 1994 to 5 of 117% in journeys from 761 million, and just over doubling the passenger miles. The passenger miles figure, after being flat from 1965 to 1995, surpassed the 1947 figure for the first time in 1998 and continues to rise steeply. The key index used to assess passenger train performance is the public performance measure, which combines figures for punctuality and reliability. From a base of 90% of trains arriving on time in 1998. The measure dipped to 75% in mid-2001 due to stringent safety restrictions put in place after the Hatfield crash in October 2000. However, in June 2015 the PPM stood at 91.2% after a period of steady increases in the annual moving average since 2003 until around 2012 when the improvements leveled off. Train fares cost 2.7% more than under British Rail in real terms on average. For some years. Britain has been said to have the highest rail fares in Europe, with peak time and season tickets considerably higher than other countries, partly because rail subsidies in Europe are higher. However, passengers are also able to obtain some of the cheapest fares in Europe if they book in advance or travel at off peak times or purchase day return tickets, which cost little more than a single ticket. UK rail operators point out rail fare increases have been at a substantially lower rate than petrol prices for private motoring. The difference in price has also been blamed on the fact Britain has the most restrictive loading gauge, maximum width and height of trains that can fit through tunnels, bridges, etc., in the world, which means any trains must be significantly narrower and less tall than those used elsewhere. This means British trains cannot be bought off the shelf and must be specially built to fit British standards. Average rolling stock age fell slightly from the third quarter of 2001 to 2 to 2017 to 8, from 20.7 years old to 19.6 years old, and orders already in place will bring down the average age to around 15 years by March 2021. Although passengers rarely have cause to refer to either document, all travel is subject to the national rail conditions of carriage and all tickets are valid subject to the rules set out in a number of so-called technical manuals, which are centrally produced for the network. Below are the total number of passengers using heavy rail transport in Britain. The numbers are calculated from September to August. This table does not include Eurostar, Heathrow Express, Heathrow Connect or open access operators such as Grand Central and Hull Trains. The following table is according to the Office of Rail and Road and includes open access operators such as Grand Central and Hull Trains. There are 2,560 passenger railway stations on the network rail network. This does not include the London Underground, nor other systems which are not part of the national network, such as Heritage Railways. Most date from the Victorian era and a number are in or on the edge of town and city centres. Major stations lie for the most part in large cities, with the largest conurbations, for example Liverpool, Birmingham, Bristol, Cardiff, Edinburgh, Glasgow and Manchester, typically having more than one main station. London is a major hub of the network with 12 mainline termini forming a ring around central London. Birmingham, Leeds, Manchester, Glasgow, Bristol and Reading are major interchanges for many cross-country journeys that do not involve London. However, some important railway junction stations lie in smaller cities and towns, for example York, Crewe, and Ely. Some other places expanded into towns and cities because of the railway network. Swindon, for example, 
was little more than a village before the Great Western Railway chose to site its locomotive works there. In many instances geography, politics or military considerations originally caused stations to be sited further from the towns they served until, with time, these issues could be overcome, for example, Portsmouth had its original station at Gosport. High-speed rail, above, was first introduced in Great Britain in the 1970s by British Rail. BR had pursued two development projects in parallel, the development of a tilting train technology, the Advanced Passenger Train, APT, and development of a conventional high-speed diesel train, the High-Speed Train, HSD. The APT project was abandoned, but the HST design entered service as the British Rail Classes 253. 254 and 255 trains. The prototype HST, the British Rail Class 252, reached the world speed record for diesel trains of 143.2 miles per hour, while the main fleet entered service limited to a service speed of 125 miles per hour, and were introduced progressively on main lines across the country, with a rebranding of their services as the Intercity 125. With electrification of the East Coast Main Line, High-speed rail in Great Britain was augmented with the introduction of the British Rail Class 91, intended for passenger service at up to 140 miles per hour, 225 kilometers per hour, and thus branded as the Intercity 225. The Class 91 units were designed for a maximum service speed of 140 miles per hour, and running at this speed was trialed with a flashing green signal aspect under the British signaling system. The trains were eventually limited to the same speed as the HST to 125 miles per hour, with higher speeds deemed to require cab signaling, which as of 2010 was not in place on the normal British railway network, but was used on the Channel Tunnel Rail Link. A final attempt by the nationalized British Rail at High Speed Rail was the cancelled Intercity 250 project in the 1990s for the West Coast Main Line. Post-privatization a plan to upgrade the West Coast Main Line to speeds of up to 140 miles per hour with infrastructure improvements were finally abandoned, although the tilting train class 390 Pendolino fleet designed for this maximum speed of service were still built and entered service in 2002, and operates limited to 125 miles per hour. Other routes in the UK were upgraded with trains capable of top speeds of up to 125 miles per hour running with the introduction between 2000 and 2005 of Class 180 Adelante DMUs and the Bombardier Voyager family of DMUs, Classes 220, 221 and 222. The first implementation of high-speed rail up to 186 miles per hour in regular passenger service in Great Britain was the Channel Tunnel Rail Link, now known as High Speed 1 when its first phase opened in 2003 linking the British end of the Channel Tunnel at Folkestone with Fockham Junction in Kent. This is used by international-only passenger trains for the Eurostar service, using British Rail Class 373 trains. The line was later extended all the way into London SD Pancras in 2007. After the building of the first of a new British Rail Class 395 train fleet for use partly on High Speed 1 and parts of the rest of the UK rail network, the first domestic high speed running over 125 miles per hour to about 140 miles per hour began in December 2009, including a special Olympic javelin shuttle for the 2012 Olympics. These services are operated by the Southeastern franchise. For replacement of the domestic fleet of intercity 125 and 225 trains on the existing national network. The Intercity Express program was announced. In 2009, it was announced the preferred rolling stock option for this project was the Hitachi Super Express family of multiple units, and they are expected to under service from 2017 on the Great Western Main Line and 2018 on the East Coast Main Line. The trains will be capable of a maximum speed of 140 miles per hour with minor modifications, with the necessary signaling modifications required of the network rail infrastructure in Britain likely to come from the phased rollout of the Europe-wide European Rail Traffic Management System, ERDS. Following several studies and consultations on high-speed rail, in 2009 the UK government formally announced the High Speed 2 project establishing a company to produce a feasibility study to examine route options and financing for a new high-speed railway in the UK. This study began on the assumption the route would be a new purpose-built high-speed line connected to High Speed 1 to the Channel Tunnel and from London to the West Midlands, via London Heathrow, relieving traffic on the West Coast Main Line. Conventional high-speed rail technology would be used as opposed to maglev. 
the rolling stock would be capable of traveling on the existing network rail infrastructure if required, with the route intersecting with the existing West Coast Main Line, WCML, and the East Coast Main Line, ECML. A second phase of the project is planned to reach further north to Manchester, Sheffield, and Leeds, as well as linking into the Midland Main Line. In June 2014, Chancellor of the Exchequer, George Osborne proposed a high-speed rail link High Speed 3, HS3, between Liverpool and Newcastle slash Sheffield slash Hull. The line would utilize the existing route between Liverpool and Newcastle slash Hull and a new route from to Sheffield will follow the same route to Manchester Victoria and then a new line from Victoria to Sheffield, with additional tunnels and other infrastructure. In August 2009 the speeds of the fastest trains operating in Great Britain capable of a top speed of over 125 miles per hour were as follows. In 2011 the fastest timetabled start-to-stop run by a UK domestic train service was the Hull Trains 07.30 Kings Cross to Hull, which covered the 125.4 kilometres, 78 miles, from Stevenage to Grantham in 42 minutes at an average speed of 179.1 kilometres per hour. 111.4 miles per hour. This is operated by a class 180 diesel unit running under the wires on this east coast route. This was matched by several leads to London class 91 operated east coast trains if their two minute recovery allowance for this section is excluded from the public timetable. A number of towns and cities have rapid transit systems. Heavy rail underground technology is used in the London and Glasgow underground systems while Ethy Mersey rail system in Liverpool shares some characteristics. Light rail with some underground sections exist in Newcastle upon Tyne on the Tyne and Ware Metro and in the London Docklands. The light rail systems in Nottingham, Sheffield, Manchester, Croydon, Birmingham slash Black Country and Edinburgh use a combination of street running tramways and, where available, Reserved right-of-way or former conventional rail lines in some suburbs. Blackpool has the one remaining traditional tram system. Monorails, heritage tramways, miniature railways and funiculars also exist in several places. In addition, there are a number of heritage, mainly steam, standard and narrow-gauge railways, and a few industrial railways and tramways. Some lines which appear to be heritage operations sometimes claim to be part of the public transport network, the Romney. Hyde and Dimchurch Railway and Kent regularly transport school children. Most major cities have some form of commuter rail network. These include Belfast, Birmingham, Bristol, Cardiff, Edinburgh, Glasgow, Leeds, Liverpool, London, and Manchester. There are four main goods operating companies in the UK, the largest of which is DB Cargo UK, formerly DB Shanker, formerly English, Welsh, and Scottish, EWS. There are also several smaller independent operators including Mendip Rail. Types of freight carried include intermodal, in essence containerized freight, and coal, metals, oil, and construction material. The beaching cuts, in contrast to passenger services, greatly modernized the goods sector, replacing inefficient wagons with containerized regional hubs. Freight services had been in steady decline since the 1930s, initially because of the loss of manufacturing on then road haulage's cost advantage in combination with higher wages. Since 1995, however, the amount of freight carried on the railways has increased sharply due to increased reliability and competition, as well as international services. The Department for Transport's Transport 10-Year Plan calls for an 80% increase in rail freight measured from a 2000 to 1 base. Statistics on freight are specified in terms of the weight of freight lifted, and the net ton kilometer, being freight weight multiplied by distance carried. 116.6 million tons of freight was lifted in the 2013 to 4 period, against 138 million tons in 1986 to 7, a decrease of 16%. However, a record 22.7 billion net ton kilometers, 14 billion net ton miles, of freight movement were recorded in 2013 to 4 against 16.6 billion, 10.1 billion, in 1986-7, an increase of 38%. Coal makes up 36% of the total net ton kilometer, though its share is declining. Rail freight has increased its market share since privatization, by net ton kilometers, from 7.4% in 1998 to 11.1% in 2013. Recent growth is partly due to more international services including the Channel Tunnel in Port of Felixstowe which is containerized. Nevertheless, network bottlenecks and insufficient investment in catering for 9-6 inches high shipping containers restrict growth. 
A symbolic loss to the rail freight industry in Great Britain was the custom of the Royal Mail, which from 2004 discontinued use of its 49 train fleet, and switching to road haulage after a near 170-year preference for trains. Mail trains had long been part of the tradition of the railways in Great Britain, famously celebrated in the film Night Mail, for which W. H. Auden wrote the poem of the same name. Although Royal Mail suspended the mail train in January 2004, this decision was reversed in December of the same year, and Class 325s are now used on some routes including between London, Warrington, and Scotland. At the time of privatization, the rolling stock of British Rail was sold to the new operators, as in the case of the freight companies, or to the three Roscoe's, rolling stock operating companies, which lease or hire stock to passenger and freight train operators. Leasing is relatively commonplace in transport, since it enables operating companies to avoid the complication associated with raising sufficient capital to purchase assets. Instead, assets are leased and paid for from ongoing revenue. Since 1994 there has been a growth in smaller spot hire companies that provide rolling stock on short-term contracts. Many of these have grown thanks to the major selling off of locomotives by the large freight operators, especially EWS. Unlike other major players in the privatized railway system of Great Britain, the Roscoe's are not subject to close regulation by the Economic Regulatory Authority. They were expected to compete with one another, and they do, although not in all respects. Since privatization in 1995, the Roscoe's have faced criticism from several quarters, including passenger train operating companies such as NER, Arriva and First Group, on the basis they are acting as an oligopoly to keep lease prices higher than they would be in a competitive market. In 1998, Deputy Prime Minister John Prescott asked rail regulator John Swift QC to investigate the market's operation and make recommendations. Many believed Prescott favored much closer regulation of the Roscoe's, perhaps bringing them into the net of contract specific regulation, i.e., requiring every rolling stock lease to be approved by the rail regulator before it could be valid. Swift's report did not find major problems with the operation of what was then an infant market, and instead recommended the Roscoe's sign up to voluntary, non-binding codes of practice in relation to their future behavior. Prescott did not like this, but he did not have the legislative time allocation to do much about it. Swift's successor as rail regulator, Tom Windsor, agreed with Swift and the Roscoe's were happy to go along with codes of practice, coupled with the rail regulator's new powers to deal with abuse of dominance and anti-competitive behavior under the Competition Act 1998. In establishing these codes, the rail regulator made it clear he expected the Roscoe's to adhere to their letter and spirit. The codes of practice were duly put in place and for the next five years the rail regulator received no complaints about Roscoe behavior. In July 2004, the Department for Transport's white paper on the future of the railways contained a statement it was dissatisfied with the operation of the rolling stock leasing market and believed there may have been excessive pricing on the part of the Roscoe's. In June 2006, Gwyneth Dunwoody, the House of Commons Transport Committee chair, called for an investigation into the company's. Transport commentator Christian Wolmar has asserted the high cost of leasing is due to the way the franchises are distributed to the train operating companies. While the TOCs are negotiating for a franchise, they have some freedom to propose different rolling stock options. It is only once they have won the franchise, however, they start negotiating with the Roscoe's. The Roscoe will know the TOC's requirements and also knows the TOC has to obtain a fixed mix of rolling stock which puts the train operating company at a disadvantage in its negotiations with the Roscoe. On November 29, 2006, following a June 2006 complaint by the Department for Transport alleging excessive pricing by the Roscoe's, the Office of Rail Regulation as it was then called, announced it was minded to refer the operation of the market for passenger rolling stock to the Competition Commission, citing, Amongst other factors, problems in the DFT's own franchising policy is responsible for what may be regarded as a dysfunctional market. ORR said it will consult the industry and the public on what to do, and will publish its decision in April 2007. If the ORR does refer the market to the Competition Commission, there may well be a hiatus in investment in new rolling stock whilst the Roscoe's and their parent companies wait to hear what return they will be allowed to make on their train fleets. This could have the unintended consequence of intensifying the problem of overcrowding on some routes because ETOX will be unable to lengthen their trains or acquire new ones if they need the Roscoe's to cooperate in their acquisition or financing. Some commentators have suggested that such an outcome would be detrimental to the public interest.
This is especially striking since the National Audit Office, in its November 2006 report on the renewal and upgrade of the West Coast Main Line, said that the capacity of the trains and the network will be full in the next few years and advocated train lengthening as an important measure to cope with sharply higher passenger numbers. The Competition Commission conducted an investigation and published provisional findings on August 7, 2008. The report was published on April 7, 2009. A press release. Three companies took over British Rail's rolling stock on privatization. A number of other companies have since entered the leasing market. Spot hire companies provide short term leasing of rolling stock. Railways in Great Britain are in the private sector, but they are subject to control by central government and to economic and safety regulation by arms of government. In 2006, using powers in the Railways Act 2005, the Department for Transport took over most of the functions of the now wound up Strategic Rail Authority. The DFT now itself runs competitions for the award of passenger rail franchises, and, once awarded, monitors and enforces the contracts with the private sector franchisees. Franchises specify the passenger rail services which are to be run in the quality and other conditions, for example, the cleanliness of trains, station facilities and opening hours, the punctuality and reliability of trains which the operators have to meet. Some franchises receive a subsidy from the DFT for doing so, and some are cash positive, which means the franchisee pays the DFT for the contract. Some franchises start life as subsidized and, over their life, move to being cash positive. The other regulatory authority for the privatized railway is the Office of Rail and Road, previously the Office of Rail Regulation, which, following the Railways Act 2005, is the Combined Economic and Safety Regulator. It replaced the rail regulator on July 5, 2004. The Rail Safety and Standards Board still exists, however, established in 2003 on the recommendations of a public inquiry, it leads the industry's progress in health and safety matters. The principal modern railway statutes are The railways are one of the most heavily unionized industrial sectors in the UK. See Passenger Transport Executive. See List of Companies Operating Trains in the United Kingdom. This is only the earliest of the main line openings. For a more comprehensive list of the hundreds of early railways see List of Early British Railway Companies. Many lines closed by British Railways, including many closed during the beaching cuts, have been restored and reopened as heritage railways. A few have been relayed as narrow gauge but the majority are standard gauge. Most use both steam and diesel locomotives for haulage. Most heritage railways are operated as tourist attractions and do not provide regular year round train services. Several pressure groups are campaigning for the reopening of closed railway lines in Great Britain. These include From 1995 until 2009, 27 new lines, totaling 199 track miles, and 68 stations were opened with 65 further new station sites identified by Network Rail or Government for possible construction. On June 15, 2009 the Association of Train Operating Companies, ATOC, published the report, detailing schemes around England where it believed there was a commercial business case for passenger network expansion. The published proposals involved the reopening or new construction of 40 stations, serving communities with populations of over 15,000 including 14 schemes involving the reopening or reconstruction of rail lines for passenger services. These would be short lead time local projects, to be completed in time scales ranging from 2 years 9 months to 6 years, once approved by local and regional governments, Network Rail and the Department for Transport, complementing existing long-term national projects. Thanks for watching. Don't forget like the video and don't forget to subscribe.